Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And what we're really trying to do during these SALT Talks is replicate the experience that we provide in our global SALT conferences, which is provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as to provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Jeffrey Sonnenfeld to SALT Talks. Uh, Jeffrey is the Senior Associate Dean for Leadership Studies at Yale University School of Management and the Lester Crown Professor of Management Practice, as well as the founder, president, and president of the Yale Chief Executive Leadership Institute, which is the world's first CEO college. Uh, previously, Jeff spent 10 years as a professor at Harvard Business School. He's been named one of the world's uh, 10 most influential business school professors by Business Week and one of the 100 most influential figures, figures in governance by directorship. Jeff received his AB, MBA, and doctorate from Harvard University. He's published 200 scholarly articles and seven books, including bestsellers such as The Hero's Farewell, Leadership and Governance from the Inside Out, and Firing Back, How Great Leaders Rebound from Adversity. He's a commentator, commentator for CNBC, a columnist for Chief Executive Magazine. He's frequently cited as a management expert in the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, the New York Times, and other global media. He's the first aca academian uh, to have rung the opening bell of both the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ Stock Exchange, which he has done a dozen times. Just a reminder, if you have any questions for Jeff during today's SALT talk, you can enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen on Zoom. And now I'll turn it over to Anthony Scaramucci to moderate the talk. Anthony is the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm, also a member of the Yale uh, CEO community. So uh, Anthony, with that, I'll turn it over to you for the interview. Jeff, yeah, it's a real pleasure for us to have you with us. And I'm also thrilled at the way you're dressed. So in addition to you and I both being better looking than John Darcy, we are impeccably dressed on a relative basis. And so I'm thrilled about that. I just wanted to make sure I made that point before we get started. So just don't so show your cargo shorts under the camera, Anthony, then you lose all points for being well dressed. <laughs> Well, actually, they're cargo pants. Okay, see that? I, I, I was I getting full, cold out, so you got the cargo I, I have pants. Full -length I got pants you. on for the first time since March of 2020. But uh, that's just a as whole long as the ties time. give us a little sense of authority. That's there awesome. There you go. That's that's the whole point. Now, now, Jeffrey, uh, I ask everybody this question. Uh, you've obviously got this amazing resume. You're probably one of the most well-connected people in the business community, and you just and deservedly so because your forms are second to none. Uh, but tell us something about your life in terms of growing up. Where did you grow up? How many siblings did you have? Why did you take this academic? You could have done anything, obviously. You're a polymath, but why did you take this bent? Well, Anthony, uh, thanks for asking. And uh, when John Darcy introduced me and then closed off by suggesting if people have any questions that they can go into chat, I'm glad he didn't say questions or complaints because after that fulsome introduction, uh, I think uh, probably a third of the people hate me already. In fact, as John got to the fourth or fifth paragraph, I started to slightly dislike myself as well. I think I probably sent you that stuff. So let me begin by apologizing for giving you a little too much about Jeff. But if we're going to talk about childhood, that's that's fair game. That's open season. And I'm proud of that, as, as you are about your origins, uh, Anthony. My, uh, my mom was an immigrant, uh, and she uh, came to the country and was a... Uh, very active as a healthcare planner, a community uh, activist, uh, always you know failing causes and losing candidates. She was paralyzed as an adult, uh, as a 27-year-old gymnast. She got a particularly bad, particularly crippling form of uh, chronic rheumatoid arthritis. So it's one or one or two uh, major surgeries a year throughout her life. And uh, but she was a great hero and a great role model. My dad was a small. Uh, merchant, men's clothing, but I'm colorblind if you have any complaints about my matches here. But so was he, which was incredible. He also was a volunteer fireman. So that was that was the background. My uh, my brother's an attorney at a great firm, uh, Morgan Lewis and Bacchius, but that's that's the family team, childhood family. Very, very, very cool. I want to I want to ask you about leadership, which is such a vague thing. And for me, I often find that leadership in itself 
is sort of invisible. It's so uh, it's very hard to describe. Some people have it, some people don't have it. Is it a learn trait? Is it a is it something that people can acquire and learn? Is it something that people are born with? Uh, you're one of the leading experts globally on leadership, executive management, et cetera. What what does it take? What is it? What do all these people have in common? Well, you know, as you open up with that disclaimer, uh, it cannot be taught. I think you're right to ask that. That Dizzy Gillespie had once said, you know, the great jazz musician, is that if you got to if you got to ask what jazz is, you'll never know. You'll never get it. And some people suggest that there's some there's a mystique about leadership that if you have to ask, you'll never get it. And there are even some. Uh, 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 great articles in Harvard Business Review, a great class by Abraham Zalesnik, a psychoanalyst, saying, you know, you're either a manager or a leader. You can't morph from one to the other. I don't completely agree with that. I think there are some things that you can complement yourself with, either in your management team, people around you, or be, build, you know, figure out how to leverage your strengths and compensate for areas that aren't so strong. But if you had to think of something other than intelligence and resilience, which I think we'll talk about later, there are five qualities putting aside those two. One of them is personal dynamism, your ability to excite a group, uh, that you can use colorful language and imagery, uh, and that it's really evocative. Uh, and the second one is empathy, the caring dimension. The first one, by the way, you have to say President Trump's pretty good at it. That second one, not so good. Can empathy, it's, it's caring and knowing who's around and showing uh, it not, doesn't always take a lot of money for recognition and concern, but to make it make it real. The third one is authenticity. That's the moral dimension that people uh, won't walk out on, on a limb for you if they don't trust you. And uh, a fourth one is inspirational goals that you stretch people, not to the point where they snap, but they're not happy with the status quo. And the last one is boldness, some kind of courage, not recklessness, but moving things forward. You put those five together, and believe it or not, by taking a look at research on 500 highly successful top leader CEOs across countries, we could, by this is surveying the management team and not asking the boss what makes she or he the, such a great leader, and they come up with those qualities, we can predict about 20% of your financial returns, uh, your accounting returns, about 20% of your market performance, which in my line of work, that's a lot since there's so many other sectoral and economic things happening out there that on these dispositional qualities, they move the needle, needle a lot. Although since we're good buddies, there are limits to it. I've got to, just between us, it's only good for the first 10 years as a CEO, then other things kick in. Uh, listen, it, it's fascinating. You know, I, I was, uh, I had to give up my uh, board seat at the Business Executives National Security when I joined the Trump administration, but in conversations with people at the Pentagon and military brass traveling with the American military, uh, they always emphasize the organizational structure. They emphasize chain of command. Uh, uh, delegation, having the right level of reports. The Pentagon always said you shouldn't have more than six reports, as an example. Uh, and then we watched the post-World War II order in corporate America, sort of the Don Draper America, where everyone had served in the military and you had sort of that man in the gray flannel suit and that corporate structure. And now you fast forward 80 years and we have a different dynamic uh, in terms of corporate culture. And I was wondering if you could comment on the cultural differences between the post-World War II era, the military, where we are today, how are they similar, how are they different, and where are we going in terms of uh, our leadership models? Boy, that is, um, that's really a, a, a large question because you're right, military has been fantastic for execution. We don't generally go to the military for invention, creativity. So you will go to different places for different things. Chain of command, you're right. We have reliable, they're selling reliability and not creativity. We don't want people to be arguing with the boss. Do we want this foxhole or that foxhole? You just take it and go. And that's the challenge. Now, um, I was with a preacher recently who said the last time somebody had a dozen direct reports, they crucified him. That sounds a little blasphemous, but it often is six to seven is a rule of thumb many times in, in routine execution. But you just look at the life, the life you've led, uh, Anthony. You've written very good pieces yourself, great books on entrepreneurship and startups. And you know that at the startup, that's just crazy. The model is much more like a hub with spokes coming off of it. And you rotate around. Sometimes you're the financial wizard one day, you're the HR guru the next day, the marketing wizard another day. 
uh, and that you, uh, you're the execution god yet other day, is that there's a certain fluidity in startups. So stage of life matters. And, as you and, and, and Jeff, for 11 days, you could be the communications director. You know, you don't, this doesn't have to be just one day. But go well, ahead. Funny, I didn't want to lose your train of thought, but I thought I had to interject that it was an It's funny you moment. mentioned that because is that the fluidity you brought in there at, with your boss is not is not expected. In fact, um, I, I talked to, uh, uh, <laughs> I actually had discussed whether or not he should let Bob Woodward in uh, with the president. And I referred to what Bob Woodward said in, the, in one of the books on, on Clinton, the Clinton White House, the agenda. He said it was like a uh, watching a, a, a soccer team run down the hill, everybody chasing the ball. And Woodward meant it as a criticism. But neither Clinton nor Trump saw that as a criticism. They said people like you and he like to be entrepreneurial at the top, even of a big bureaucracy. So it depends on life stage for a turnaround. It's very different. You need a certain fluidity. Uh, macro or micro. Uh, some people like Jack Welch in his best days, and he wasn't perfect, but he could go very micro and very macro. So as the, the, these uniform rules don't apply. It really matters to stage of life. And you're suggesting also by industry that uh, whether or not you're, you're in a, a fluid new industry in technology or entertainment or something, it's very different than in a business that is much more a command and control military like a utility or or, finance, or a big uh, a big commercial bank. Well, you know, we, we both know uh, Jim Collins and we know the definition of level five leadership and I won't bore people with that definition, but that's sort of the exemplary leader. One of the things that he says is, uh, absent in that case is charisma. Sometimes you don't need charisma to be that level five exemplary leader. Uh, my, I guess my question is about culture, uh, how important it is to organizations, what are the ingredients to culture, where does charisma come in, where does charisma not uh, be productive? Uh, what are your thoughts there? Well, that's a good question about culture. Uh, because when I talked about those five elements of great leadership, those actually are five elements of charisma. But it isn't just backslapping flamboyance. That's the personal dynamism. Another quality of charisma is that empathy, that people bond with you and, 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 and think that you care about them. That's a different aspect of charisma. And that authenticity dimension, as uh, Lee Strasberg had once said of the actor's uh, studio guy, uh, god, is that essence of great acting is authenticity, believability. Once you can fake that, you've really got it made. Uh, but is that those are some qualities, of course, that really matter of charisma. Charisma isn't just flamboyance and cheerleading. So uh, there are ways that you can be charismatic and have a charismatic aura uh, about you without being uh, a showman. Teachable? Is charisma teachable? Uh, they can compliment yourself, and I think there are ways. There, there is an innate the notion of charisma of an animal spirit uh, is a thought to be innate, and some people are born with more or less. But you can compensate for it. You can uh, fortify qualities that, that take you from being quite the flat wall power wallflower to actually show concern for others. Sometimes you go a little bit beyond, learn how to ask questions, and then listen to the answers. Uh, we both know TV anchors that go through a routine, and you can just see fine, the show's mine. They're not even listening. I'll talk about what I want to talk about. As opposed to somebody who really engages with you like you are right now, is that you're having a conversation that's much more charismatic. Well, yeah, and Liz, I think it's super important to be an active listener. Otherwise, how are you going to learn anything? I mean, I... I'm sorry, I, what was that? I missed it. Not to joke. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I know. I got the joke, but I've also been uh, guilty of running over people as well. So uh, far, far from perfect. But, but the... Uh, the resilient leadership book that you wrote, Firing Back, How Great Leaders Were Bound from Adversity. I got a lot out of that book, actually. It was very resonating for me. I was wondering if you could tell us why you decided to write that book, uh, what triggered that topic of leadership, adversity, and why it's so important for people to have the traits of resiliency. Well, I know, Anthony, for you and for me, this is purely an, an academic exercise that we've never had any setbacks in our no, lives. Not me, especially not me. No, neither. But friends of ours have. Yeah, and exactly. I learned I, is my that life everybody... has gone up in a perfectly straight line, Jeff. And, <laughs> it's per and, uh, perfectly and, linear. You know, but I'm, also, you the, I'm always... also the queen of denial, right? I'm also Cleopatra. My, I've, lived, <laughs> I've lived in denial, and I think I look pretty good at 6'3, 190 pounds. So, but anyway. And you've always been able to laugh about it at every moment, as well as be honest about it. And that's what's so critical is I was finding, uh, and 
it was in the late 1970s, shouldn't admit that you're this old, uh, but in the late 1970s, I started to study CEOs and top corporate leadership. And I kept finding that people were talking to me about these setbacks they had. I thought it was some false humility. And then I realized they all have a Job story or, if you, or more, like the book of Job from the Bible, with all this adversity. And they're proud of having risen above those life setbacks. If you, you don't usually find the management training programs or leadership courses or books that talk about failure. It's always onward and upward. You know, the Norman Vincent Peale stuff and the winning friends and influencing people and, and, and uh, those approaches uh, don't acknowledge the reality of setbacks. But if you take a look at the work of Joseph Campbell, the great anthropologist, and he wrote a, a book called Hero of a Thousand Faces, looking across cultures and continents and centuries, is every hero went through life stages, whether or not it's you know Moses or Jesus or whomever. And in those life stages, uh, 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 that there were a, a kind of a a point where the dragon slayer starts to resemble the dragon themselves is a great setback. And this resilience from that adversity that's so critical that it's a failure that punctuates success. It's a defining moment. Now, most people get filtered out through the setback, but those who make it through are forever changed. So that's what the research was all about. And I just happen to have a copy of the book right here by shrieking coincidence, firing back. And uh, is uh, that one of the lessons in there is, is you got to face up to it, as you did. You very, you're you the first one to make fun of it, to go on the night shows, talk to the TV shows and everything, to talk about what you did wrong, how you got snookered, and how it wouldn't happen again. But uh, people think they can sweep it under the carpet and, carpet and bury it. To, you know, take Scarlett O'Hara's advice, tomorrow's another day. No, that's not right. Or all these, all these stress therapists, PhD psychologists that tell you that go out and do yoga and Tai Chi, that's fine. But you have to face up to the problem. Everybody knows about it. CEO friends of ours who've gone off after they got fired and are waiting for their call back, that doesn't happen. Second, you don't do it alone. You have to recruit others in. You engage with a lot of people, not to make a role model out of you, but you really should be as a role model for resilience, is how to get others on board with you. Uh, is the, the research on this, on social networks going back decades, and uh, Mark Granovetter at Stanford some, did some of it originally decades ago, is that when you're in, in a setback, it's these loose ties that you have, people you knew in college or unions or high school or not necessarily family members that are, give you support on an emotional level, recruiting others that you know in a secondary way. They give you job leads and opportunity. A third one is to rebuild, to show you could rebuild whatever went wrong is uh, you need to um, uh, show some exoneration or contrition one way or the other. But you know, when some prince goes marching around in a Nazi outfit and said, well, if I offended somebody or goes off to celebrity rehab, that doesn't do it. You've got to show authentic contrition or like, you know, or, you know, prove you did nothing wrong. Like Martha Stewart going off to prison. I don't think she should have. I think she should have screamed to the mountaintops. She didn't do anything wrong, but that's a whole nother story. And then, and then you've got to, um, to prove you can still do what made you great. You've got to give, uh, no matter how you feel politically about President Trump, you go down the west side of New York, you see his name on top of those buildings, which he doesn't own. And uh, and uh, But to get the deals done, they still needed to put those brands. And, and things that where somebody can rise from setbacks, uh, his bankruptcies, which you know, it's the R word, restructuring, or we get in trouble. Uh, but that resilience from adversity is, is quite inspiring to show that you can still do what made you great. And then you look at, uh, say, Jimmy Dunn of Sandler O'Neill is one of the most remarkably resilient leaders I know is they lost a third of their workforce in 9-11. And uh, he went to work right away when everybody thought that they were they were given up for dead. Even CNBC announced that they were closing. He went on CNBC, never done an interview in his life and said, no, no, we're not. As these are my best friends. Uh, we're going to bring this back to life. We're going to help the, the public safety workers who perished trying to save our people running into buildings that we were running out of. And they devoted themselves, put their partner's wealth back in, paid off the uh, the people, uh, the families who suffered the losses. And it's a remarkable story of resilience, but they don't define themselves by the past. They, they always have a tribute to the 65 people they lost and all the rest. Uh, and they took care of their, their benefits and healthcare and education for the kids, but they define themselves by the future. And that's so important to not look backwards uh, as, uh, or you become a culture of mourning. It's teachable. Professor, yeah, it's 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 teachable. That and, one is definitely teachable. I believe that's why I want I want you to. Expand as Nietzsche says, what what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And and yeah. you know, look at you. Look at look at all these resilient leaders out there. Uh, and I think that that's a, a really critical lesson. Well, well, what I'm always grateful 
forward to you is you gave me an opportunity to speak after I got fired from the White House at the Yale CEO Summit. That was very nice of you. Uh, one of the reactions- well, We knew like, like Steve Jobs or Bernie Marcus of the Home Depot, that you were only going to be better from the experience of having been pushed. Or Michael Bloomberg, all these guys got fired. You, you name it. If they're great, they probably had a major career setback. And uh, and uh, the way you handled it was fan fantastic model for everybody. Well, it's, it's very nice. We can keep going. I'm not even going to allow John Dorsey to ask any questions if you're going to keep talking <laughs> about this. So we can keep going. But I, I was actually going to bring up a point. And it's very sweet of you. I appreciate that. It was a very tough period of time for me. We have a lot of young people that listen to these podcasts, I, uh, these salt talks. I guess the lesson here is you got to dust yourself off and you got to not take yourself super seriously uh, because once you start doing that, then things can get problematic. Um, yes, don't define yourself by your business card. You can get a new card. That's yeah, exactly. And also, you know, you, you got to roll with life. I, I've always lived by the adage, Jeff, that uh, the legendary Mel Brooks, relax. None of us are getting out of here alive. And so if you, <laughs> you can, if you can frame it from that point of view, right. it makes you feel better about what's going on when it's not going well. But the real, I was going to bring up something. I was speaking at your CEO conference. I believe it was in the Roosevelt Hotel, actually, uh, which is now being closed. I don't know if you're aware should, of that. We should buy it. The place yeah. is gorgeous. It's prettier yeah. than Waldorf was that the, the lobby that is the public. Yeah, there's no question. It's a breathtaking hotel, such a, a great New York history in there. So many different presidential campaigns trafficking through there, et cetera, mayoral, gubernatorial campaigns. Uh, but the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is that I was there and absorbing from your CEO something I'd like you to comment on. Uh, their relationship with the Trump administration boy, that was super complex to me. And uh, I can give my observations, but I'm more interested in having you give your observations. But I will say one thing that I'd like you to react to. The number one thing when I left that presentation was these guys do not want to be tweeted at. They don't want their corporation publicly traded in a presidential tweet. And they certainly don't want their names in a presidential tweet. And that was going to create some level of uh, stock market fluctuation and possible communication crisis. Uh, and so I'd like you to elaborate on that. Am I right about that or wrong about that? And then describe in your words, the relationship that these CEOs that you're so close to have or have had with the Trump administration. So we, we got another two hours, right? Yes. No, we can take it three, four hours. Is uh, I was... Uh, as you know, I had a personal relationship, not just with Joe Biden, but have continued at least until this interview with President Trump. Uh, and it, uh, I, I, I think, I haven't had an IRS audit, but at least we get to see somebody's returns, is uh, that uh, I, I was the first critic of The Apprentice, that even the New York Times was entertained by it. And I was writing a weekly column for the Wall Street Journal at the uh, invitation of uh, of NBC, which was then headed by uh, Jeff Zucker, if you know. Uh, uh, and it, so NBC would send it to me a day in advance, He would, uh, and uh, Wall Street Journal would print it. Well, uh, Donald Trump, Mr. President Trump, didn't like what I was writing. I called uh, the first episode uh, something like um, a, uh, a musical chairs game at a Hooters restaurant. And uh, he, uh, you probably haven't noticed this, he doesn't like a lot of criticism when there's humor at his expense. Have you noticed that? So anyhow, it didn't go over well. And uh, he wanted to cut that, shut down my reviews. I said, hey, that's fine. I don't need to do it. But, but the Wall Street Journal said, let's try another week. And the other week I said, boy, I said that first week was the worst uh, portrayal I could imagine of business leadership ever on TV. And they, Mr. Trump asked me to look at the next week to see if I would reconsider and I said, no, I'm not. All right, so I'll reconsider. He was right, I was wrong. I recant what I said last week. This week's episode is worse. And um, so it got nasty. You can imagine the exchanges and the threats. And we ultimately wound up getting together. And as you know, when you're with him, he can be so charming. And my wife was, you know, I had all the outtakes in advance. That's a whole other story. And my wife found them charming too. We, we got, so we wound up becoming friends from then on because he promised to change the show. Instead of putting engaging young millennials up for this um, uh, uh elimination game format is uh, that he would uh, get these fallen celebrities then which was actually my idea which he now admits i didn't think of um of uh, of perhaps a meatloaf and and gary Busey, but the, but still was the idea of having these uh falling celebrities go after each other but then um so i brought him to one of my ceo summits and the people that uh, 
filled the president's, uh, the White House Advisory Council, and many of those same people who didn't know Trump, they said, if he's coming in here, that, as some of them referred to him as a clown, some people who, who the press has seen as very close to him in recent years, I said, if he walks in here at the Waldorf, we're walking out. What happened? He walked in, they walked out. So uh, somebody who wasn't quite of that level of corporate leader had introduced him, and he was mad. Why'd those guys leave? And I pointed that out to him in 2017, and he said, well, they're all coming by here now. I said, gee, I wonder why that is, is they were skeptical of him. At our CEO summits, perhaps two-thirds or so or more are Republican, and yet it was roughly 70% were surprisingly supporting Hillary Clinton. They didn't support his election, though in 2017, they were quite hopeful. They raced with enthusiasm to those White House Business Advisory Councils, high, high hopes on regulatory rollbacks, which they saw. And this is large business. Small business liked him a lot more because he was such a, seen as such a maverick. Uh, but uh, the regulatory rollbacks and the tax, the, 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 the tax relief they thought was great. However, those one-offs you're talking about, which we saw happen uh, in the Republican uh, primaries, we saw throughout his life, those one-offs of, of Pfizer versus Merck or GM versus Ford, Boeing, uh, Boeing versus Lockheed, the CEOs did not like that. And then as he started picking on these various companies for doing what they had to do to run their business, whether or not it was Harley Davidson or Amazon or whatever, that he was calling for boycotts against them, they didn't like that. And so it was after Charlottesville, it's the first time in American history we saw the U.S. business community refuse a call to action when they all walked off following Ken Frazier of Merck's model, walked off the business advisory councils. They started to see him differently and they developed a certain confidence through collective action, whether or not it was on immigration issues or, or this election where they have a certain confidence that they uh, recognize, like Benjamin Franklin said, if we don't hang together, we shall surely hang separately. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal stuff, and we could go on for several hours. I, I'm going to ask you one last question because we have great audience engagement, and so I want to let John... Uh, you sure they're not saying really hateful things that I'm not looking at? Okay. Well, no, 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 no. You see, I mean, you see, you see we're all... We're all sensitized to that sort of stuff. But, you know, if you look at my Twitter feed, Jeff, you'll feel very good about the comments they make about you. But but uh, this is about executive compensation. And Malcolm Gladwell said a few years ago that it was uh, Kurt Flood that opened up the spigot for executive compensation. And so for those of you that don't know who Kurt Flood is, he was the first baseball free agent. And uh, Malcolm Gladwell's position was that as baseball players and athletes started making astronomical sums of money, it, it left the door open for CEOs who were running very large businesses, arguably more important jobs to make even more astronomically sums of money. And it seems like the spread between CEOs and the average workers and the companies that they're leading has gotten quite high wide, if you will. What's your opinion uh, of that? Do you think Far that be it for me to criticize a far more uh, successful author than, than I am. Uh, but Malcolm Gladwell might have referred to Catfish Hunter m more successfully. And, and he also, uh, in fact, if he wanted to stay with baseball, referred to Babe Ruth. Uh, and, and when people questioned Babe Ruth's salary opposed to Herbert Hoover's, it was pretty easy for him to say, well, who had a better year? Uh, and it's... Uh, we do see often, somewhat from left-leaning groups, but also in the center and some activist investors, about CEO excesses in compensation. That since I've been a professor, um, which is which is more than just a couple of years, unfortunately, is we've seen roughly a thousand percent, one thousand percent increase in CEO compensation, and about a twenty-five percent to thirty-five percent increase in average worker compensation. People are upset about that. And for understandable reasons, the average worker, the average CEO is making now 278, 280% more than the average worker. That, and it used to be 30 times when I started doing what I'm doing. So what's going on there? Well, some of that is ridiculous and some of it's understandable. Some We've globalized the workforce and we have very different business units. So some of it, it's apples and oranges comparisons uh, as to uh, who some of those average workers are comparing like the celebrity athlete to an usher uh, that's working in the stadium, uh, if is that the magnitude of how many people are executives and how many people are not executive has changed a lot. So there's there are those two sets of issues, and a third one has to do with performance. 
And I frankly don't care how much money Bernie Marcus or the Home Depot or somebody like that made for creating something that wasn't there, or Bill Gates, whatever. If there's something at personal risk, they put into it. And they have really been a big builder as a great entrepreneur, as a great business creator, creating lots of jobs, very philanthropic, fantastic. It's the people who are corporate drones that are Klingons that are uh, just getting a large salary because they've hired a comp firm to, to lay, take a look at benchmarking against other firms in their industry, and it doesn't correspond with their performance. That's the trouble. And we see very low correspondence between performance and compensation. We see it just a lot of financial trade. There are some fairly modest compensated uh, executives with, with soaring corporate performance, and, and that's a problem. I, I, I would tempted to name names, but I won't. But one of the world's largest transportation companies, one of the world's large, greatest retailers, have fairly modest compensated CEOs with performance that towers over it. There's one big media baron, which I, I should, I'm so close to them mentioned, he's, but he's no longer there, but he was recently, made more than the next, three, or next two media barons combined, and their performance towered over his. It was, didn't make any sense. So those, some of those, uh, anyhow, you get me going. I, I always avoid this question. Whenever CNBC or somebody wants to talk about compensation, it's such a, a no-win situation. I avoid it. But for you, I, I stepped into it. Oh, no, no, I appreciate it. Look, I want people to make money. I'm, I'm for all about unlimited upside. At some point, you and I will have to talk about the right policies to put in place to make the playing field. From we need to work on that. Yeah, we, we've got to make the playing field for an equal opportunity perspective. A livable now. wage is, has, to be, has to be addressed, too. You're absolutely yeah. right. No, no, no question. Are, I, there, I, I, I love the fact that we have the Jeff Bezoses and the Bill Gates in our society and, and the Elon Musk. God bless them. But I also want to help that kid that's growing up in that blue-collar family uh, live the arc of the American dream that we would all love to see happen to he or she. So what that's that, right. Uh, For this to be as aspirational as they think those high salaries are, it's, the wealth has to be shared a lot more. And again, it has to be linked to performance better. It's short. It's tied too much to short term stock incentives and not enough to long term investment in that enterprise to create more jobs and to build a stronger business in the U.S. Well, we got to We got to get there. And you're going to be a big part of that, I believe, in our future. I'm going to turn it over to John Darcy, John Tylus Darcy. You know, there's you know, I'm Jackson. a millennial. And there's John Tylus Darcy. I'm a millennial. I guess I, I dress down. At least I'm not wearing like athleisure or something, right? Um, but Ken Langone, back to your theme of you know the the value of leadership. He's one that has spoken at Salt several times and has talked about. Uh, you mentioned Bernie Marcus earlier, but just the the unlimited, incalculable value of strong leadership. Uh, and and he's always a, a big critic of these criticisms of executive compensation for companies that really knock the ball out of the park. But well, John, uh, it's tough enough to match wits with Anthony. I'm so happy you didn't put me in the shadows of Ken Langone. He definitely uh, throws quite a fire of energy out there. Absolutely. He's not shy about expressing his opinions uh, on the topic. And he's, not, but... and he's not slowing down, Jeffrey. He just turned 85. Not slowing no, down. No, Johnny Carson once said, never follow children and animal acts on stage. If he was around today, he would say, never follow Anthony Scaramucci nor Ken Langone on, on... <laughs> This is a joke that I should have left for Anthony, but it's it's apropos that we transition from talking about Ken Langone to talking about grudges. So Ken Langone famously says, you know, he doesn't know if he's going to heaven because he has this just deep hatred in his heart for Elliot Spitzer. But it's an exception to a rule that you write about, about the power of not holding grudges. Anthony makes a not, joke not, about- Not to interrupt, you know, but I, I love that about Ken because I'm a fellow Italian. You know what Italian Alzheimer's is, Sonnenfeld? There you go. Perfectly you, you never, done. You never forget a slight, right? Yeah, you never forget the grudges. You, you, right. you, you can't remember what day it is, but you do remember the son of a bitch that tried to hurt you. All right, right. Go ahead, Darcy. Go ahead. But you've written about the importance of not holding grudges, and especially as President-elect Biden comes into office during a time of deep divisions in the country, he's made it clear that he doesn't want to be involved in investigating his predecessor or preying on those divisions that might have been created in the previous administration. Why is it important? Why is it so important for an individual in a leadership position to set an example of not holding grudges? And how does it help organizations move forward effectively? I, I wish I could model it as much as I admire it in others. Uh, is uh, Joe Biden, is uh, President-elect Biden, is one such great example of that. And the selection of Kamala Harris, where a lot of, uh, a lot of Biden's advisors thought that what was done to him was gratuitous in that, I think it was a January debate, uh, uh, last year, where um, she took him on in positions that were quite similar to positions she held and caught him by surprise and 
he'd considered her a friend of the family and things, and he just seemed a little bit winded by that. People were angry about it. He got over it. He understood that, hey, this is, this is a contest here. People are using what they can use, and he understood why she did what she did, and he admits it surprised him. He would go up to whether or not it was, uh, you know, a lot of the candidates talked about how afterwards, if they did really well in a debate, he would congratulate them regardless of how well he did and talk about what they did that was so effective and what, or what he learned from it at any age. That's, that's really fantastic. I was at one event, since we're just among friends here, where uh, Vice President Biden uh, used a joke that didn't go over well. It was kind of a, a malapropism was in there. Can you imagine a gap from, um, from President like Biden now? No way. It wasn't perfect. Uh, and people were starting to snicker. Who immediately shut it down? It was Elaine Chow and Mitch McConnell said, cut that out. That isn't what he meant. You know what he meant. And they said, he's our friend. And, and uh, Mitch McConnell and Joe Biden know that they have that. When there was a stalemate in the o Obama years, it wasn't uh, taking it to Harry Reid or Chuck Schumer or, or, or through Mitch McConnell to work things out. It was Joe Biden or President Obama. Joe Biden would parachute in there in the sequester stalemates and things like that. Is he has a way of getting to people on a very natural basis. He's, he's not a, a name thrower. Uh, and this was a, a mud thrower. And, uh, he, this uh, frustrated some of us uh, through the primaries because that's just not his nature. I, I don't know that he's quite Quaker-like. He, he has some temper but he restrains it. And that dignity, I think, is a great model to not, not have the negativity guide us into the future. So I think if, among many great qualities that I think we'll see in, uh, in President-elect Biden's leadership style, it's going to be that forgiving, positive style to find out where there is common ground and move forward from there. He doesn't see compromise as a bad word. And we don't have to look across the aisle. We can look within the Democratic Party. I had a great political historian today who was taking a, we, we got him, David Mayhew, uh, uh, in an earlier class today. I wanted to talk about the divides in each party. And he said, they're not so great. We're exaggerating it because the media would like to do that for drama. But in fact, to negotiate between the people who call themselves progressives, which are really uh, democratic socialists, and the people who are classic progressives, which are the middle of the road people, it's not a, a divide that's any greater than we had the, 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 the um, yellow dog Democrats or the Dixiecrats or whatever else that these parties have, you know, have had complex uh, uh, coalitions always. So focusing again on that, you know, using politics as a context to talk about an issue, I want to talk about transitions. It's another topic that you've written academic papers about, about the importance of smooth transitions and transfers of power within corporations. Obviously, we're in the midst of a sort of messy transfer of power right now from President Trump, who's still contesting the results of the election, to President-elect Biden. Biden's transition team is having to sort of uh, circumvent the normal official processes for transitions. But uh, people have warned on both sides of the aisle about the dangers to national security, especially in the middle of a pandemic, not sharing information about vaccines and Operation Warp Speed and that type of stuff. But you know, using our current uh, backdrop as context, how can organizations effectively manage executive transitions? And why is that so important for continuity within an organization? Well, there's a lesson here. Of course, it's a lesson of a bad sportsmanship we see uh, and to, to challenge the rules if they don't work out your way. Uh, that, that's a problem. I think uh, as CEOs have rallied in distress, Thursday night of uh, November 5th, when President Trump overreached in a a uh, news hour broadcast uh, at a press conference from the White House briefing room to suggest I hereby assert powers that he didn't have. That alarmed a number of CEOs. So we pulled together 30 of them uh, between 7 p.m. of that Thursday night and Friday morning. I got a group together of 30 Fortune 150 CEOs that were that worried, thinking we need to figure out how to uh, uh, confirm that this was a, a, a an efficient, fair, and safe election as his own as his own cybersecurity and election security experts have confirmed that there is no evidence of any fraud out there and to celebrate the winners uh, as they did immediately. They set the trail as, as these CEOs called for the business associations to do that. The business roundtable did so. It seemed within minutes of when Pennsylvania was declared the very next day, they came out with an excellent statement that was the virtual, almost perhaps verbatim model that not only other trade associations used, but also heads of state around the world. You can actually take a look at it. And President Bush, it's almost the exact statement that that conferral of legitimacy was very important from um, uh, independent, nonpartisan bodies like that. 
but I wrote a book about this uh, in terms of the corporate models. Just happened to have this here too in an earlier book called The Hero's Farewell. And that doesn't mean that every CEO, every head of state is not just necessarily heroic in terms of noble things they do, but in their minds, they see themselves that there is one person in the world truly indispensable and they know who that is. And the monarchs have a real problem leaving office, whether or not it's uh, uh, with Sumner Redstone or, or uh, taking a look at Armand Hammer for anybody who remembers him from Occidental Petroleum or other examples where people, they don't tend to want to leave until there's a palace revolt or they die in office and it's a feet first exit. And that's to some extent what we have right now as a monarch. There's a different sort called generals like, I don't know, Steve Jobs or, or others that uh, Howard Schultz did this of, of Starbucks. They leave and something happens that necessitates the triumphant return to power as generals are often called out of mothballed retirement. A third group ambassadors have a wise, tranquil passing of the baton. That's what the, often the corporate world has looked for. Uh, Intel used to do this really well and others uh, where you, in fact, we've seen this at, at IBM recently, we've seen it at Pepsi recently, we've seen it uh, at a number of places at uh, Disney, a fantastic tech successor from within. And the final group is a, a governor, somebody in terms of bound to term of office, goes, goes and does something else. And But there are different types of transitions. The hardest one is the monarch. They tend to be big disruptors as a leader. And when they leave, it's quite disruptive. So we have a question, you know, maybe apropos to the difficulty that monarchs or very powerful people have a giving power away. There's a book called The Psychopath Test that contends that a large percentage of CEOs are somehow on a psychopath spectrum. It, do you think that's an accurate assessment that uh, people in, in positions of tremendous power develop certain cognitive uh, disorders, if you will? And, and what other books do you recommend on understanding leadership? Uh, well, this is a great book called The Hero's Farewell that I just fell on my floor here somehow that I, I, would, I would argue picks up on, on that point very well. There, um, since uh, it's just us talking, and there are no CEOs ever going to see of this. Of course, but, we're not. We're not accusing all members of your your community of being psychopaths. Of course, no. But here's what Freud said. Freud, Sigmund Freud said, society is changed by its discontents. People who are just not happy with the way the world is. They are. Robert Motherwell, the great painter, used to talk about the anguish of creativity. Is that it's that he talked about artists like himself who would sneak into a gallery at night to touch up a painting on the wall is the, the, the beauty of creativity is the act is never quite done. There's always a restlessness in them. So it doesn't make them always the easiest people to live with, uh, but the world is different and hopefully better because of them, but they want to be seen in life as net producers and not net uh, consumers. So they're always on the go. There, there's no, there's no halfway switch about them. And that's a, we're lucky to have people that do that. They bring a lot to society that way, but it's a challenge to deal with creative geniuses and big builders. How, how do you deal with that drive to leave a lasting legacy? Because they're not gonna live forever. The great psychoanalyst Otto Rank talked about uh, in Art and Artist, a book and how artists and, and top mythic leaders are more like each other than they are other people in society. is just because they're fueled by a dream of creation. And when somebody discards that dream, they're shattered. So it's, it's called a, a heroic um, mission, if you will. It's a, it's a quest for immortality. A separate dimension, though, that makes these leaders different is you can get fused with the job. I think that's some of what we're wrestling with with, with President Trump is when your name becomes hyphenated with the job. It's a, it's a heroic identity. Nobody ever called Alexander III of Macedonia, Alexander the Great, until he made up this false lineage to Odysseus and Achilles. He and his mom made it up, but he started to believe it. And that's some of what we're seeing right now in the White House. You start to believe your own myth-making. It gets hard to separate those identities. So the heroic identity and the heroic um, mission are, are two things that make leaders really difficult, really different, but really difficult. They're, so anyhow, sorry you asked, aren't you? No, it's a fantastic answer. And and we obviously recommend your books, of course, which are uh, tour de forces on, on leadership across a variety of different subject matters related to leadership. I want to ask you one more question from our audience. And it's about, you know, corporations in this era of you know, heightened social and political justice type of initiatives have started wielding, it seems like, a little bit more power. You know, you have uh, someone like BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world that's focusing on ESG sustainability initiatives and and starting to, you know, be a little bit more heavy handed in, in what they ask of companies that they're invested in. You see corporate CEOs 
pulling out of advertising deals related to content that doesn't meet their standards. How has corporate activism evolved over the last, say, 100 years, 50 years? And how do you think it will continue to grow? And do you think it will continue to grow into the future? Uh, it's a, I, I love closing on that question. There's a circularity to it. Uh, 50 years ago, the Business Roundtable was created to do that. But you wouldn't know that from recent discourse because it was a year ago, almost a year and two months ago, the Business Roundtable came out with a statement of redefining capitalism more broadly. But that was why they were founded, is that great generation, as Tom Brokaw called them, the great generation. But these people were great builders, great diplomats, great corporate leaders, great scholars, whatever they did, great soldiers. They, they, the Second World War generation saw themselves with those sweeping duties, sweeping responsibilities that were very important. The Cuyahoga River was on fire in Ohio uh, 50 years ago. The, the Tennessee Valley of drums of discarded waste, toxic waste was discovered. Uh, the Love Canal problem was happening in the, outside of Niagara Falls of, uh, of uh, Hooker Chemical Division of Occidental Petroleum. Irving Shapiro, uh, the, one of the founders of the, of the, uh, the CEO of DuPont, one of the founders of the Business Roundtable said, we can't fight this. We need to be a part of the solution. He helped create the Superfund cleanup. The, uh, Tom Phillips of, of Raytheon said, we're upset with our competitors in, in the aerospace and defense industry paying bribes to other countries that was coming out at the time. We need to even the playing field because we fight fairly and we think you can be a defense company and not be a dirty company. There's a way to do it. So they, they fought in favor of the Foreign Corrupts Practices Act, which is remarkable. The whole term corporate social responsibility, which predated ESG, was coined by uh, Reginald Jones, Jack Welch's predecessor at GE, affirmative action, uh, the IBM and AT&T, well, that was the, the diversity and inclusion concept of the time, uh, more quota driven, but it was, it was pioneered by those companies. Now, they weren't the norm. They broke away from then a more reactionary business roundtable and National Association of Manufacturers, but they, these were 200 companies that said, we want to be progressive and what progressive really meant. In fact, the progressive movement always was very centrist and positive movement. They're, they were the ones who were trying to clean up workplace safety, trying to not have labor battles uh, uh, become violent in the, in the workplace, trying to deal with uh, immigration with settlement houses and building roads and dams. And that's who progressives were historically. That's who business leaders were. But we lost our way. I, re I remember testifying before the SEC at the time of Sarbanes-Oxley that all these trade groups were taking such a hostile view toward needed reform. So they got legislation that was imperfect because they wouldn't help it. Similarly happened with Obamacare. Jeff Kidler, if he was here to defend himself, the CEO of Pfizer, found very little support from the business community to help him make better legislation. So he had to do what he could with what it was. They had become uh, reactionary and obstructionist. Boy, they found their voice. Jamie Dimon made things a little bit better. And, and Doug McMillan, it's just off the charts. Things, great things, the business roundtable and Ken Fraser, Mary Barra, uh, Alex Gorski. Uh, you start to look through these CEOs, Bob Iger, whether or not they're members of these associations or not, uh, Ken and Bob Iger and Ken Fraser or not, is that they, they see that the role of a business leader is a, as a, 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 a pillar of public trust. Richard Edelman's great data shows that 92% of the public wants to see a business leader as a major source of trust engaged in social issues. Uh, even uh, Morning Consult's data similarly finds almost 80% of the general population says that they're much more proud of their employer if they do engage in these issues, but they have to pick and choose. They're not politicians. They can't get involved in every issue, but when they have, when something really matters, uh, they've had a big impact. And so, sorry, you asked that question too. I happen to no, like- I, I'm very grateful I asked that question. Uh, it's a tremendous response. And Jeff, we're so grateful for your your time. I like to tell people maybe they haven't heard of whenever there's something important going on in the world, whenever people are trying to solve a big problem, we always bump into you. You know, Jeff is always uh, in the room where it happens, as Lynn Ma Manuel Miranda wrote uh, of. Uh, it wasn't Vice always President my Burr. fault, though. It yeah. wasn't always my fault when it happened. No, it wasn't always your fault, but you're there to clean up the mess. And, and uh, you know, you, you're, you have bipartisan influence. You know, you're not a partisan person. You call the shots like they are, and people respect you for it. So it's a pleasure to have you on. We've talked about having you hopefully moderate some of these salt talks for us and grill some of your uh, corporate members of the Yale CEO community. So we're very much looking forward to that. Anthony, you have any final words for Jeff before we no, let him listen, go? Listen, I, uh, I appreciate your friendship, Jeff, particularly – after I got fired. And for those of you that need a resilience lesson, uh, if you get fired from the White House, you're rolled in broken glass on Pennsylvania Avenue, then salted, and then put through the sewer pipe in the Shawshank Redemption. 
and then lit up on late night comedy, call Jeff Sonnenfeld. Okay, he'll cheer you up. That's my message. Uh, well, thank you, Anthony. I, I just, I, I think that you are an inspiring example of, of character and that's what really matters, regardless of what the situation is. As uh, Thomas More said, uh, as an advisor of King Henry VIII, character is as fragile as having a liquid cupped in your hands. Once you separate the fingers, it's forever gone. No matter what's going on in your life, you've never lost your character. And that's something really to admire. Well, it's very sweet of you. Well, I, I look forward to seeing you non-virtually at some point, Jeff. And thank you. And we'll get you out to one of our live events, which I can't wait for. I look forward to it. Happy you. Thanksgiving. Well, I'll talk to you before Thanksgiving. Thanks. I'm honored. Thank you.